Yeah, hi, I'm Andra Farkas. I'm one of the, or I'm the other EMS doc at the University of Colorado. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. I'll be recording and please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Great, and then now we see your face. We are very fortunate tonight to have our very own Mark Scherschel, um, who is the director for pre-hospital care, has a long career, long career <laughs> in uh, EMS and pre-hospital education, and as well as being an active member on a DMAT team. He's going to talk to us tonight. Our theme tonight is kind of MCI and triage and disaster response. So, Mark, I'll let you do more of an intro for yourself, but we're fortunate and excited to have you here to chat with us about um, disaster response. Thank you, Dr. Wright. So what we're going to do tonight, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with the federal disaster response, which can be uh, small locales or very large urban areas. And I'll kind of get into the operational aspects of that. And then one of our disaster slash emergency medicine physicians Dr. Noel will join us for more of a clinical side of things. So with that, I will share my screen and get started. Uh, let's see. All right, can you guys see the presentation mode there? Yes, we can. We can see the slides on the side as well. Yeah, we can see your slides. Um, huh. Well. I mean, we don't mind seeing the slides. Okay. Well, you're going to see the slides. Yeah, then we can anticipate your next move. Yeah. Um, well, this is strange. Oh, well. I don't know why it's not doing the right. All right, we're going to power through. So I've been with uh, UC Health for three years prior to that, 28 years in Denver as a medic, left there as the deputy chief paramedic. Um, during that time, I also worked in several smaller agencies, PRN and on the side, just because I wanted to keep my foot in the clinical things as I was moving along my career. Um, so I've got lots of experience with urban and uh, more rural EMS as well. In 2009, I built a second Colorado DMAT. DMAT stands for Disaster Medical Assistance Team, which is a federalized team that falls under the Department of Health and Human Services. And they're very big sticklers about us talking about it and being on their slides. So this deck has gone through their process, which is why it's uh, HHS slide and not our newly developed Reese slides. <clears throat> so the objectives for tonight are familiarize everybody with federal support for disasters or public health emergencies, identify when support is appropriate, and an overview of disaster medicine that Dr. Noel will take care of. So the National Disaster Medical System is- Hey, Mark. Yeah. If you're advancing your slides, we're still seeing the first one. Oh, well, this is going well. Let's try something different. Now, what do you got? Circumstances for which an MDS. Okay. Uh, let's try this. Do you get presentation mode with that? Oh, yes. Beautiful. Okay. Well, we've made some progress. So the National Disaster Medical System is the umbrella under which all the DMATs fall. That is housed in the Department of Health and Human Services. However, NDMS is actually a partnership between HHS, Homeland Security, Department of Defense, and the VA. So about 20 years ago, all of those agencies got together 
and said, we're not really doing the health and medical aspects of major response very well. And that's when the National Disaster Medical System or NDMS was kind of born on the federal level. The intent is to supplement state and local medical resources during disasters or major emergencies. Pre-pandemic, our bread and butter was kind of hurricane response. So I've got a bunch of slides coming up about, you know, major hurricanes impact an urban area with lots of destruction and flooding. And the DMAT teams would roll in and, and help out the local healthcare infrastructure while they got back on their feet. The last two and a half, three years, uh, we got very much into some different uh, mission types with augmenting hospitals for COVID. Some of that was because of uh, staffing being sick. So their, their patient load was high and then a good chunk of their staff came down with COVID in the early phases. So they just needed staff to come into their, their hospitals, which were fully intact and fully operational and take care of those patients while their own staff became well. Some of those also were just complete, you know, overwhelming of a hospital system. They had enough staff, but they had, you know, 140, 50, 60% of their normal capacity. And we would go in and one, help augment the staff and two, help decompress the hospital and move those patients to other NDMS hospitals. The secondary thing that DMATs do is provide medical support to the military, the Department of Defense, and the VA in overseas uh, conventional you know, warfare type of things. In my tenure of 14 or so years of doing this, um, I have not had any missions like that. There have been a few, but you know, they're not boots on the ground, you know, working alongside the military. It's more about evacuating patient, you know, people out of a war zone and some of them need a little bit of uh, medical care on their way back to the States or wherever they're going to repatriate to. Um, so not a, not a major part of NDMS, but it does happen on occasions. So circumstances in which the, and I'm going to apologize for my light if you're seeing me on video because it likes to save energy and turns off about every two and a half minutes. Um, anyway, circumstances for which NDMS may be activated. Um, any presidential declaration of a public health emergency or disaster. So think Stafford Act, you know, giant size destruction. Um, those are, are pretty much a given that we're going to be called up and, and go to those areas. State requests for uh, major medical assistance. So there was a lot of state requests for the pandemic. Um, that's a public health type scenario that I'm hopeful we don't see any more of for a long, long time. Um, but we, de we deployed multiple times at the request of the governor at various states in support of the pandemic. The National Transportation Safety Board can also request us. And that's pr pr preliminarily for more of a, what we call a DMORT mission or mortuary mission, which is not part of the medical assistance teams. That's a separate team. And they go in with forensic pathologists and morticians, and they do a lot of identifying of um, casualties of NTSB type accidents. Uh, the military contingency, like we talked about, the overseas conflict, um, haven't seen a lot of those, but it's on our mission set. And then the other one is other fe federal agency to agency request. Um, the most common one of those is when FEMA gets on the ground and FEMA is different than DMAT or NDMS, but FEMA does not do a lot of the health and medical aspects or the ESF-8 aspects of a response, and they will they will routinely request us after an impact of a, a storm or a natural disaster. So what exactly is a DMAT? Um, it's a group of intermittent federal employees, and, and I, I think of it more as a, a PRN position. So you're, you're technically a federal employee. You get paid when you're 
when you're active and deployed or on um, official training, they'll pay you per diem, they'll pay your travel, they make sure you're covered with malpractice and workers' comp and all of those type of normal employment type benefits. Um, but if you're not deployed and you're not doing any mandatory training, you're idle and you know there's there's no pay for most of the time. But you are an intermittent federal employee. The the typical deployed team is somewhere between 24 and 50 people if we go out as a team. The that number changes a little bit depending on what the mission set looks like. And what they'll do is send out an advanced team after there's a, an official request and they'll kind of scope out the, the size and, and nature of the deployment. And then they will in turn talk to headquarters and then they'll determine what's needed on each team. The, all the team members are covered under USERA. So USERA is the Uniform Service Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. It's a uh, public law across the country and essentially it's the same coverage that our National Guardsmen and women have when they go on training or deployment. So if I get called up and need to leave work suddenly to you know, go pack my bags and start on a deployment, all I need to do is notify my employer that I'm leaving and I can be gone for um, quite a long period of time. And they essentially have to give me the time off and and have to welcome me back and give me my job back when I return. Now for us in the DMAT world, it's not as big of a impact as it is with the National Guard. National Guard, if you know you work with any of them or if there are any National Guard people serving that are on the call, um, you know that you can be deployed for a year pretty routinely. Um, DMAT deployments, if they're on the continental US are limited to 14 days as a you know kind of an expectation if they're outside of the continental us then that gets bumped up to a 21 day deployment and then you're you're back at at your home station and able to go back to work um, hhs controls all the credentialing um, essentially the medical direction of the teams with a chief medical officer that is in dc and and has oversight and we're not really protocolized like like EMS in the states, um, but there are you know the standards of practices that the chief medical officers filter down through the medical officers on the team, and then they in turn filter it down to to the people on the team. Like I said earlier, covered by liability, workers' comp, malpractice, um, all of those type of coverages are included in the intermittent federal employee employment. So DMAT staffing, it's literally everything you would need to go set up a field hospital in a field, in a parking lot, you know, any, anywhere you're needed, um, we show up with that staffing. So there's physicians, there's PAs, there's nurse practitioners, nurses, medics, EMT, pharmacists, respiratory therapy. Um, we have a pretty incredible set of logisticians. Um, never ask them where they got you the things you ask for, but they always come through and, and get the stuff we need. We have communication specialists that set up satellite phones and satellite links to send our electronic medical record back to headquarters where it's all evaluated and data is gathered on patient types and burn rates on medications. And it's a pretty remarkable system that without our comms people, we, we just wouldn't be able to do it. We always deploy with a safety officer. Um, there, as you know, ICS, you know, the safety officers, the, the one person that can halt things, you know, at a moment's notice if they think something isn't safe, which in our world is kind of a moving target because there's always lots of dangers and hazards and uh, messy operational you know, places. Um, and then there's people like me, the leadership staff that gets to try to help all the clinicians have what they need and have a clear path for doing what they do. So our mission sets, um, these haven't changed much over the years with the exception of um, immunization clinics and 
you know, pandemic type type response. But starting in the top left corner, patient evacuation. And there's a slide on this coming up in a few. Um, but inside a disaster area, one of the one of the elements of success is evacuating patients out of the impacted region. So one of our branches will will set up and literally just be moving patients to other NDMS hospitals and uh, getting them out of that area so that we can take care of the influx of patients. The austere emergency room, um, again, some slides coming up on that, but if you think about an infrastructure devastating event and a hospital is less than you know full capabilities, we can show up, set up our tent hospital out in a parking lot or a field or wherever we can find the room to do it and start taking care of patients um, either to, to augment what is done in what's left of the, the hospital. Um, many of my deployments, you know, we can limp along an emergency department with what they have. And normally that's a better place to take care of the critical patients. So we'll take, you know, green and yellow type patients out in the parking lot in the tents. And then, you know, operationally they'll take care of those more severe patients inside what's left of the building. Patient reception is basically the opposite of patient evacuation. So if there's a big storm down on the golf course, those patients are gonna go to kind of concentric rings, you know, up into Atlanta, um, you know, further north into Carolinas. And, and at those airheads, as we call them, but basically airports, um, those patients will be received and then cared for and loaded into transport vehicles to, to get to other hospitals. Medical screening, um, the, be the best example of that was early on in the pandemic, there was a cruise ship uh, coming to port in San Diego and quite a few people with you know, COVID-like illness. And we wound up quarantining that entire ship and screening you know, the people as they were going through quarantine and caring for them if they got sick and uh, just kind of watching them if they, if they didn't. Immunization clinics, I think we all uh, have had our, our fill of those lately. And then aeromedical evacuation and, and critical care assessment team is basically the kind of the next level up of air transport. And, you know, the military will bring us C-130s that are set up for patient evacuation and we'll load it with uh, multiple critical patients. And you have critical care nurses, physicians, and medics caring for, you know, 15 or 20 critical care patients as they fly them to somewhere that's not infected, by, not affected by the disaster. Deployment info. Um, so each team, and there's a about 46 teams across the country. Some states have none, some states have multiple. Um, like Colorado has the two teams, Wyoming doesn't have any, um, the Dakotas don't have any. Um, get into Florida, Texas, and California, and, and they have multiple teams in each state just based on their, their population. The size of the team that is deployed is 35 to 50. However, the actual team size is closer to about 100 is, is what we're trying to get to. Um, and that's simply because not everybody can be on a roster every month. Um, my team is up next month in May, and I can only be on part of the roster because my youngest is graduating and being commissioned into the Navy in San Diego. So I'm not going to miss that. So um, I'm only available for the first part of the month. So that's why we'd like to, you know, have a little bit of bench strength because um, life happens and people have, you know, things they need to attend. People get hurt, sick, um, have families. And, you know, so we need to be a little deeper than that 35 to 50 for the full team. Something that we've been um, trialing with quite a bit of success is a, a health and medical task force where a much smaller footprint goes out with a lot less equipment. And they're typically in the seven to 14 person range, and they can do a lot of that initial assessment. 
They can go out with other federal agencies like public health service is one that we commonly deploy with and, and do some smaller missions. So like I said, hurricanes used to be our bread and butter. Um, the system is growing and, and being recognized for what we do. So um, we're picking up uh, more mission sets. Um, but flooding, earthquake, tornado, typical natu natu natural disasters um, has typically been what we deploy to the most. Um, Terrorist attacks are, you know, another thing that unfortunately we've been involved with. I was not in the system when 9-11 hit, but we had teams on the ground there for um, several weeks, if not months, um, at ground zero, set up a tent and took care of a lot of the, you know, the rescuers and um, people doing recovery work on the pile. This is a picture of um, one of the airheads or the, the patient transport areas. Um, and you see their military air aircraft coming in, ambulances waiting, and the DMATs can help facilitate the transfer of the patients either into the helicopters or out of the helicopters, depending on which end of it you're on. National security events is another thing that we deploy to um, quite routinely. So State of the Union, um, Olympics, if and when they come to town, the DNC, the RNC, presidential inauguration, um, and Independence Day on the Mall are, are things that we've deployed to. If you ever get on a team and you get a chance to do Independence Day on the Mall, it's a blast. Um, set up a couple of tents. You take care of, you know, a lot of heat type injuries and, you know, things like that that we see um, at special events in, in the summertime. Um, but it's a giant party and it's a lot of fun. So if we deploy a full team, um, we're deploying 100% self-sufficient. So our, our thought and our goal is to hit the ground and need nothing from the area that's affected or the, the hospital that we're going to. We have medical supplies for 72 hours, power, food, water, communications, um, food for staff, their MREs, and I don't know how many of you have eaten MREs for three days straight or longer, but um, they get old. Do you hear that, Andra? Didn't mean to do that. Please continue. My apologies. Okay. Um, so there's, you know, cash, the cash arrives from one of our mission support centers. There's three of them across the country and another one in Hawaii. So you can imagine we might get on the ground before the cash arrives. So we also carry, you know, a go bag. That's basically our 24 hour bag. And it's, it's you know, a uniform and a spare set of um, underclothing, uh, MRE and, and the vital stuff that you need to care for patients. Um, so each of us will carry that into a mission and it's kind of funny, nobody leaves their go bag sitting anywhere because they don't want it to get wet, they don't want it to get stolen. Um, so, you know, you'll see DMAT teams running around and everybody's got a backpack on and that's why. So field deployment, um, like I said, parking lot, uh, football field, um, any, you know, gymnasiums in schools, any territory we can find in the area that we're needed that we can set up is, is typically what we do. Um, the picture here is our kind of our basic setup and it's uh, four of the large Western shelters that I believe are 19 by 35 and then uh, about a 16 or 18 foot octagon. The larger tents are where we do all of our medical care. We'll typically set up one for kind of a triage greeting area and then one for red, yellow, green. Um, the octagon is command and control and pharmacy typically. Um, we do show up with a, a full pharmacy cache and it doesn't have everything, but it's got most of what is needed um, to care for the critically ill patient. And it's also got a lot of the things that people lose in disasters. So, you know, your house gets flooded or, you know, taken down by a hurricane. 
and you're leaving without your typical medications that, that you, you typically take on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we can refill those to prevent those patients from, um, or those people from becoming patients that, that need more care. Uh, generators, lights, AC, all that stuff kind of runs through the middle, which we'll see in a minute. Um, that's kind of the, the backside of a base of operations or a boo, as we call it. This deck's a little old, which you can tell from the life pack sitting on that cot. Um, but outside of that, this picture is pretty similar to what we set up today. It's the same cots, uh, same tents. Um, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards, but we have upgraded our monitors. We have the Zolas now, so we got that going for us. That's kind of the, you know, setup as you get things loaded up and all the logistics start arriving. Um, it gets a little crowded, but it's ready for patient care. This is a Texas 4D mat doing an airhead after Katrina. Um, and like I say, distributing those patients away from the affected area is, is one, of our, one of our mission sets. Um, in addition to the military transporting these, these patients, um, we also have the National Ambulance Contract that typically FEMA will uh, implement. They, they are the ones that hold the contract. That contract is basically stating that the, the contractee can provide Three, up to 300 ambulances within, I don't remember if it's 24 or 48 hours, but it's pretty quick. GMR, which is the parent company for AMR, um, was recently awarded that uh, $1.2 billion contract for the five-year um, period in which they're going to cover it. So, And they do a great job. I've had great experience with um, having ambulances outside our base operation and ready for us if we need them. Shelter missions is also another big part of what we do. So uh, an area gets devastated and you know those people need to go somewhere. So they'll open up an arena like this one. Um, and it's, it's not great housing, but it's a roof over their head. And typically we get you know food in and everything else. The issue with them is a lot of people come in and have uh, vulnerabilities and have significant medical histories. And, you know, so we'll go in and, and try to keep those, keep those people from becoming patients as well. Um, so provide medication, help them with things like CPAP. And, you know, it's a, it's a lot of primary care type medicine to prevent them needing to go to the ER, or be admitted to the hospital. This is a screenshot I took. Um, as I was heading into South Houston for Harvey in 2017, we flew into Dallas, Fort Worth and kind of assimilated our team there. And then we needed to get down into the area. Um, we had a couple of large charter bus buses for all of our personnel and part of our equipment. And that's what the highway system looked like on maps. It took us 18 and a half hours to drive what's normally about a three, three and a half hour drive. And nobody else was driving inbound to Houston at that time. The, the highways were empty, but most of them looked like that. So um, the estimates are 127 billion, with a B, tons of water fell on Houston over about a four day stretch when Harvey stalled over the city. That equates to 34 trillion gallons or about 60 inches of rain. Um, so Houston was literally underwater. That's a picture from an overpass on our way down. We had to skirt the highway clearly because we weren't driving our Greyhound buses through that. Um, we did eventually get down there and set up at a high school, um, a full base of operations, but we were able to use their gymnasium because it was on a little teeny bit of a hill um, and was not completely flooded. So we worked in the gymnasium. Uh, we slept in a theater room that was basically a large walk-in closet. Um, it was a 24-7 operation, so half the team slept during the day in the large walk-in closet, and 
then we reversed it for the night shift. Um, we were there for two weeks, things kind of settled out, and uh, that's when we, we pulled up stakes and demobilized. Which brings up one of the points. So when DMATs deploy, it's free medical care. You don't get a bill for any of it. Um, if you're refilling medications, if you're getting sutures, you know, anything that's provided medical care wise, the federal government does not bill for it. That's all well and good, but people get that word pretty quickly and, and that word travels. So they start coming to us um, for things that perhaps they should be going to um, an urgent care, a freestanding ED, a regular ED. Um, and what we don't want to do is stay too long and, and basically have a negative impact on those other facilities reopening and starting to do the business that they're there for. So um, for Harvey, for us, it was two weeks and, and we demobilized. This is a picture of Panama City after Hurricane Michael, which hit um, right just a little bit east of Panama City and uh, was one of the larger, more destructive storms in recent US history. This is the Bay Medical Center after Michael. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of devastation to that hospital. Um, windows were blown out, roofs were torn off. Um, they had no potable water. They had no power for a long time. Um, we did eventually get some generator power and you know, big tanker trucks to hook into the, the water system for the hospital so you can at least flush toilets and sort of wash hands, but it wasn't potable. Um, so a lot of devastation there. It's another picture of Bay Center. Um, for that mission, we set up outside the hospital in the parking lot. Once we got, you know, kind of the ER up and running a little bit better, they took the reds, we took the yellows and greens. Um, and we were seeing, you know, three, 400 patients a day in the tent, which is, a, you know, the university hospital here on Anschutz, we'll see about the same numbers in you know, a perfectly capable and modern emergency department. Um, and we were doing that in tents. So it was a, a long, arduous deployment to, to say the least. We left that hospital after 14 days, but then we were backfilled by another team. Um, and I believe they stayed the entire time and I'm not sure if they were reloaded or not. But. So that's kind of the end of the presentation. Um, what kind of questions do people have? Mark, I have a question. I'm sorry if you covered this in the beginning. I was trying to feed tiny mouths. Um, but our, does a disaster have to be declared for a DMAT to be deployed? Is it all kind of collaborated through the federal government or are there situations where it's not a federal disaster, but you would respond anyway? There are situations where the governor will ask for help. So any of our involvement has to go from the governor to the president. The president will basically hand it off to HHS slash NDMS, and then we'll decide, you know, they'll decide if we're going to place a team or a health and medical task force, um, essentially what the needs are based on an assessment. Um, so it doesn't have to be a disaster declaration. And the pandemic was a classic example how, you know, we didn't have declarations, but we deployed um, a lot for pandemic support. Gotcha. That makes sense. Uh, there is a question in the chat, Mark, about how do people join? Oh. That was, let me try this one more time. That was the last slide. So usajobs.com, um, it's not a perfect system, but you can go into usajobs.com and uh, start by creating a profile upload your CV or your resume, kind of follow the steps. And then you can set alerts for national disaster medical system, paramedic, PA, whatever position you're looking for. 
Um, I don't have any control of when those postings get set up. Sometimes I get visualization on them, so you can email me as well. Um, and I'll put my HHS email in the chat. Um, it's, it's tough to get on a team. It can take a year plus to actually get on the team and then in a, another six months to get through the onboarding, initial training, credentialing, all of those kind of things. So it's, it's an arduous process just to get on the teams, um, which is why my team needs, well, all the teams basically need people, um, medics, docs, nurses, you name it. We've got openings for all of them because the hiring system is not that great. Thank Thanks, you. Uh, Jeremy, I see you have your hand up. Hey, Mark, thank you for doing this. It's Jeremy Dewall, this is a great topic. Um, how does the communication work? This is something I don't know at the DMATS as far as like you mentioned that you really bring a lot of communication. How does that integrate with the local EMS and hospital communication systems in those areas when you come in? Thanks. Yeah, integrating, and I should have added this to the, the deck, integrating with the locals is um, really the most important part. And it doesn't matter if it's hospital leadership or EMS leadership, um, but integrating with that community is really the key to a successful mission for us. Um, we've got to work closely with all of those agencies, facilities, whichever, um, to make sure, number one, we're doing what is helpful for them um, and, and filling those needs. So, you know, basically liaising with EMS leadership, hospital leadership, um, all the way down to, you know, facilities for the hospitals and public works in the local community. Um, one of my first details when I arrive is, you know, to, to start making those contacts with, with local authorities. Um, when we were in Panama City, um, we had five or six large SUVs. Um, we wound up going through every spare tire in the first day that we were there because there was so much debris on the road. Um, went through facilities who, you know, had a friend of a, a brother or whatever um, who had a tire store that the roof got ripped off, but he just happened to have a bunch of tires and um, we invoiced a, a whole bunch of spare tires from him and, and it, you know, he was able to, to solve that problem for us. So that kind of liaising is, is vital to our success. Any other questions? All right, well, I see Dr. Noel on here. Um, so I will turn it over to her and um, Andre put my, my email in the chat. Go ahead and uh, hit me up if you have other questions or need more information. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce Dr. Samantha Noll and then let her uh, introduce herself. Um, but she is one of our uh, emergency medicine, internal medicine, and disaster medicine doctors. Um, she is pretty much amazing. And she is going to do a little bit more on MCI and um, just share her expertise with us. And Sam, are you able to um, share the screen? Okay. Yeah, I'm about to do that now. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Andra. So being here. <laughs> Absolutely. Multitasking is hard. So just a second. Let's see if I can share my screen appropriately. Do this. Share. All right. And then let me see if I can pull the chat up as well. Great. All right. So I'm pulling up the participant list as well as the chat. So if people have questions or anything, they can go ahead and raise their hand. But um, as Andra stated, I'm Samantha Knoll. Um, I work clinically at UC Health as an ER physician and hospitalist. I was previously trained um, and completed a disaster and operational medicine fellowship at George Washington in DC. And as Bark stated, I actually got to play with NDMS teams during the inauguration and during some other um, kind of big events that were going on in the DC area. And it's definitely a good time. And um, I think there is actually a current job opening for many different levels of positions for DMAT teams. So I think that job hosting is active right now. So definitely worth um, a search on USA Jobs. So now for the purpose of this um, discussion, I will be discussing triage, treatment, and transport following an MCI. 
Um, I have no financial disclosures, and I do want to make a point of saying that this discussion does not supersede any agency or jurisdictional protocols or processes, and care should be within the scope of practice. All right, so the objectives are to discuss triage systems in the pre-hospital setting, identify pre-hospital life-saving interventions. Um, you'll see a lot of the term LSIs in the PowerPoint presentation, uh, discuss care during transport um, when uh, receiving patients during MCI, um, addressing EMS communications with receiving hospitals, and discuss some special situations related to an MCI. So mass casualty incidents, what are they? They're an incident in which the number of patients or victims can overwhelm resources. And so this could be any kind of overwhelming of resources. Uh, this could occur in a rapid period of time, or this could be ongoing, something like the COVID pandemic, and it may be static or dynamic. So there could be just a one hit like a tornado um, or ongoing natural disasters like hurricanes or ongoing terrorist attacks and things like that. And something to note, um, as we I know that we have quite a different or varied group of people on this call today, is that different jurisdictions will have varying definitions of what they consider an MCI, both in the pre-hospital setting and in the hospital setting. And different numbers of patients or casualties or different kinds of situations may trigger activation of an MCI. So keeping it broad, mass casualty incidents could be really anything. Um, I know, unfortunately, what may come to mind are things like mass shootings, sea burning events that could include toxic exposures or chemical releases, whether or not they're intentional or unintentional, any kind of blast or explosion, terrorist attacks, in addition to things that we may see more often like fires, structural collapses, large motor vehicle collisions, any kind of water accidents or near drownings and extremes of temperatures, of course, really cold, really hot, flooding, and then anything that requires specialty care needs that maybe an area doesn't have readily available. So let's think about a scenario that unfortunately has occurred. Um, it's Sunday morning, it's about 10 a.m. Um, you happen to be at church in a rural area or you're um, on shift during a Sunday morning. And uh, what occurs at a church is someone opens fire and there's a mass shooting. Um, you get reports from dispatch that um, there are potential victims and potential deaths on scene. You're unsure if the shooter has been neutralized or if it's an ongoing incident. And you know that the closest hospital that has an emergency room is a critical access hospital with um, about 20 minutes away. And the closest uh, level one trauma center, actually there are two that are about 50 minutes to an hour away. And you and happen to be on shift and you get this call. What are you thinking about? What's coming to mind? Anyone can put it in the chat or just start speaking freely. I see staging and resources, absolutely. Scene safety, absolutely, totally, from Grand County EMS. <laughs> Triage, oh yeah. Well, great, yeah, as first on scene, you may have a lot of responsibility. Oh, we're getting to the good stuff. Bed availability, transport, patient tracking. Oh, your ICS structure and lots of transfers. Absolutely. So your first priorities are going to be scene size up, especially if you're one of the first on scene, trying to recognize the type of incident and life safety issues for anyone involved, um, anything that could be happening to property, um, and then immediate resource needs, and then assigning resources or requesting resources once you have a better idea of what's going on. And as most of you were discussing scene safety, you know, is this, is the scene ongoing? Are there hot and warm and cold zones? Or in the setting of a collapse, is the structure safe? And then is there a hazmat issue going on? And then of course the dreaded secondary attack or second hit if there was some kind of an intentional incident going on. So again, if you're one of the first on scene, you happen to be right by and you dispatch to the area, you know, you could be in charge. And so other things you may be doing is establishing incident command if you're one of the first responders before other teams on scene, or you might be part of transition to unified command and be a big part of the medical branch. 
Other things, of course, that are coming to mind are triage, transport, and treatment. And of course, the most important is communication. So your team can figure out what you need to do, how to be safe, and how to care for patients. So let's start with triage. Doing the greatest good for the greatest number. And I think what's most important with triage is recognizing your limitations and resources. So a few triage systems that we're going to discuss is first start triage. Does anyone use start triage for MCIs within their jurisdiction or their um, EMS service? Anyone using ramp or salt? All right, well, um, I'm bringing up START um, as a lot of people are familiar with it. And so as you are, a lot of you seem to be familiar. Um, yep, some teams are using START, some using RAMP. Um, and so what we're recognizing is that, you know, still assigning reds, yellows, and greens, recognizing who's gonna need immediate care for survival, who's gonna, um, who's possibly yellow, who's green. and. I think the start triage is good and a lot of people are very knowledgeable on it. I think it just takes a lot of steps of counting and assessing patients and things like that. And one thing that came out in 2019 was a model uniform core criteria for mass casualty triage. And I think it recognized the basics of triage, no matter what system you use, that it should be simple and easy to remember. It should be able to be applied to all ages and populations and should be able to apply to kind of all hazards or all MCIs and should be able to be used in austere environments, should be able to visualize, visually identify triage patients. And that's why that color scheme is so great. And it may be a dynamic process where you continue to reassess patients or the situations might change. And I bring this up because I know that certain groups have been moving to SALT triage system and other people still are sticking to start. And then as we talked about RAMP as well. And I think what I like about this, and I'll focus on this mostly specifically for the life-saving interventions, um, are that it's still a sorting method. It's still applying things like immediate delayed, um, minor and expectant and dead, unfortunately, patients. And um, what I like about it, though, is that it recognizes that there are quick life-saving interventions you can do to help optimize, of course, the survivability of certain patients who have certain injuries. And so, as I mentioned, SALT or START, um, there have been studies done that show very similar ac accuracy and very similar outcomes, and um, as well as similar under triage and over triage as patients as well. And as most of you probably know, we'd like to minimize under and over triage as much as possible so that we can get the most appropriate resources to the um, patients who are needed the most. And it seems that most or both SALT and START triage systems still apply about 30 seconds per patient when you're looking at them and assessing them. And I think what's also nice about using either of those is that as long as you can identify who's immediate or who needs to be transported or cared for to optimize survivability, I think that's what's most important. And both of these systems do that, which I think is the most important what it comes down to. And we'll talk about um, a little bit more further care for all different patients. Sam, can I ask a quick question? Of course. And the differences between those, did they look at, at levels of training? Like is one better for, you know, more of like a first responder EMR, EMT and another for paramedics or advanced responders or, or did they kind of look across the board? So one study I saw that looked at that actually just showed the amount of time they had in that position. So not necessarily the, the level of training, but how many years you've been doing that role, which was kind of interesting, but also kind of not surprising. Oh, interesting. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So again, a little bit overwhelming, but just want to start talking about globally sorting and again, similar to start as well. And so we'll talk about step one. And so step one is overall sorting. And that's when you're talking to patients, if it's a large group of um, casualties or victims and prioritizing, you know, who's the sickest, who's not so sick and who may be looking all right. And so you can just use simple commands and say, hey, anyone who can walk, let's get up and walk, let's move over here. And anyone who can't maybe walk, but can hear me, 
maybe a thumbs up and then who's really sick where you might be able to easily identify, okay, they're not moving, but I see chest rise, I see them breathing fast. We gotta do something. And so the first priority in step one, to be very confusing, is to try to recognize who's gonna need life-saving interventions, who's likely immediate or red. And those are people who aren't following commands, um, don't have those purposeful movements, but are still breathing, maybe breathing fast, maybe have a bit of an altered level of consciousness, but not too bad. And you can identify some kind of life-threatening injury, whether it's penetrating, wounds, visible hemorrhage, or things like that. And so you've recognized that these people are important. I'm going to need to put a little bit more time with them. And then that priority two that we were talking about is who can still follow commands but can't walk? Who's the person who can give me a thumbs up or is kicking their leg or waving their arm? Something like that. Um, who maybe is more yellow or still could be a red, but maybe they just um, can hear you and they're focusing and they're able to, you know, say, hey, I'm over here, but can't get up. And then as I talked about, who can walk? Can we assign an area maybe for them to move and move over to a certain area to kind of get out of the way from the people who need immediate care um, and maybe not have life-threatening injuries, which we'll talk about some pitfalls a little bit later as this slide would <laughs> tell us. So the issues with that first step about sorting is that anyone who potentially has a blast injury could have eardrum rupture and maybe can't hear. Or if it's in an incident with language barriers where either people are hearing impaired at baseline or um, are deaf or speak a different language so they don't understand what you're saying, or people with some kind of traumatic brain injury who are confused. And then of course the people who can ambulate but still have a life-threatening injury, something in their neck, something in their back or torso, um, but they're still able to get up. And then what do you do with families? You know, people aren't going to get up and walk away. They're going to stay with their sick family member and make sure that they're okay. And so that's why the sorting isn't perfect. Um, just like no triage system is perfect, but at least hopefully we can, with the majority, be able to do that initial sorting. Other special situations, as I was somewhat hinting at, is do you have time to establish a casualty collection point? If it's such a large area or a large incident, or there's so many people, can you organize if you can so that you know I'm going to try to put all my greens over here, or I'm going to put all my reds over here, or I know that I need to stage in a completely different area, um, or this could be potentially unsafe and I'm going to have to move people around. And in the most ideal setting, as you can see in this picture down below, is do I have tarps <laughs> to assign care? This could be something that's a little time consuming, or you may not have these resources available, and that's okay. Um, just keeping in mind that I may, you may need to organize and sort people, and physically sorting may be helpful. And then having a safe area. What if everyone's okay, but maybe they'll need to be reassessed, um, kind of like a green area? And then who may need psychological first aid, or this may be an area for reunification. So keeping all these things in mind when you're initially sorting patients. So we'll talk about next steps. And again, this is focusing not on memorizing the SALT triage, but let's talk about some life-saving interventions we can do. So some of the life-saving interventions that have been listed include hemorrhage control, opening the airway, chest decompression, use of antidote auto injectors, and I'm also adding to this use of naloxone, either nasal injectors or also naloxone or Narcan auto injectors. And why would these things be noted in the triage system? This may be one of those you have to think what I'm thinking about. It's because hopefully this equipment is readily available. It should be within the scope of practice for a lot of people on this call, but maybe not everyone. And it can be performed quickly and you don't necessarily have to stay with the patient. So doing a quick jaw thrush or chin lift with opening the airway or doing a quick needle decompression or placing a tourniquet might be something that can really help, again, improve survivability in some of these patients. Um, and then you can walk away and move on to the next person. So let's talk about hemorrhage control that we can do pretty quickly. The use of tourniquets. I think it's really neat and really impressive how tourniquet education has just 
blown up significantly, no pun intended. So, so many different people are trained in how to use a tourniquet. Um, hopefully those are on most of the rigs of, for all of you. And hopefully you have a marker with them just so that you can document the timing of the tourniquet being placed. Um, as most of you know, you can tighten the tourniquet until you lose um, the distal pulse. That's the ideal way of placing it. I'm not gonna go into the rest of the technical things. Um, I, there are other opportunities for that, but just to know that it's okay to apply a second tourniquet proximately to the other tourniquet, as long as you're not over a joint. But especially for people with long transport times or difficulty with transport, I would consider or reconsider if you're going to place a tourniquet, if it's gonna be on for greater than two hours. And fortunately, there are studies to show that tourniquets, even adult or the standard tourniquets, okay to use in pediatri pediatrics. And if you are really fancy and have a junctional tourniquet and you think it's appropriate, go ahead and use those junctional tourniquets. And don't forget to use them in also other instances like blast injuries or amputations. Um, I know I tend to think more about um, penetrating injuries and things like that, or if I see obvious vessel injuries with severe lacerations, but definitely can be used with crush injuries, amputations, and other blast injuries. And then if you have them, the, just the use of direct pressure or hemostatic agents like quick clot or those special packing um, gauze and things like that, that you may be able to just place on the patient and then move on to the next. Other life-saving interventions is just opening the airway. Um, if you see signs of apnea, you can do very basic maneuvers. I tend to recommend the jaw thrust just because in the setting of um, possible C-spine injury, the chin lift might be a little more difficult or may potentially be unsafe to do. Um, but that jaw thrust and opening up the airway may be helpful. And then in pediatric populations, there's also recommendations for two rescue breaths, which again, that's if you have that bag mask on you, not necessarily you have to do mouth to mouth, <laughs> um, but something to consider if you happen to have that Ambu bag on you. Chest decompression, also known as needle thoracostomy. That can be considered in our patients that have respiratory distress and obvious torso injuries. Definitely in penetrating, if we have some kind of um, impalement, GSW, but of course can be considered with blunt and blast injuries as well. Um, I know different uh, protocols are definitely in place where um, some people still recommend the going in at the fourth or fifth intercostal mid axillary line, which is the B on this image, um, but also the anterior axillary line, which is the C, and then also the second intercostal or mid clavicular, mid, mid -clavicular space where you're going just right over the rib there. Um, I will say to, again, if you have a specific protocol you've been trained on or something you're more comfortable with, go ahead and do it. There has been some information out about controversial data due to patient's body habitus or the amount of skin there. And I would say that um, if you have special needle thoracostomy, um, angiocasts like 18 gauge or larger or longer catheters as well, um, that even the standard length catheter, which is about 3.5 or under four centimeters still would work. Um, so in case you need to do that, I, you can follow your protocols, but just feel comfortable in knowing that the data is not slam dunk amazing for any spot or any location and to do what, what you're comfortable with. Chest seal placement. This is another thing we can do for concerns for sucking chest wounds, which I know sounds a little intense, but as you can see in the photo, if you see some bubbling when people are breathing in and breathing out, or if you hear a hissing or sucking sound, the concern is that the fact that you're developing more of a tension pneumothorax because that wound um, is gonna be larger than the trachea. So air will wanna travel into those wounds instead of going in and out of our own airway. And because of that, it builds up this pressure and thus placing a chest seal might be very beneficial and life-saving for the patient. And ideally any kind of seal, any seal you can make. If you have fancy, chest wall seals, that's great. Go ahead and use them. If you have to use a tegaderm and tape down three of the sides for that kind of one side open spot, or if you just even want to use a defibrillator pad and put it over the wound and then burp it every now and then to make sure you're kind of relieving that pressure, you can do that. Whatever you're most trained on, whatever equipment you have, 
um, just know that you could be potentially saving a life um, by doing some kind of management there. Other um, potential life-saving interventions, um, if you have access to antidote auto-injectors can be definitely life-saving um, in the setting of organophosphate exposure, which that could be with pesticide exposure, um, but could also be something like nerve agent exposure as well. And these are, these are auto-injectors you can use. The really fancy ones are the Duodote because it's just a one-time injection, but there's also the Mark I kit that has two different medicines in it, but you will need to do two different injections. And you're doing these most likely on the lateral uh, thigh muscle. And these are used again, um, which I'll I have an upcoming slide for, um, for when you see those cholinergic toxicity where people have a lot of, um, a lot of saliva, a lot of like, they call it bronchorrhea where there's a lot of air in, uh, sorry, a lot of secretions in the airway, maybe diarrhea, vomiting, um, as well as potentially seizures or um, any kind of fasciculations or even paralysis, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then again, I'll challenge you, if you have any kind of Narcan auto injectors, God forbid we have one of those massive opio opiate poisonings that I feel like are red hats or there are some people who get paid a lot to come up with any kind of potential incident um, or nefarious kind of terrorist attack where everyone has some kind of fentanyl exposure um, of some kind that using the Narcan nasal spray or using the Narcan auto injectors, I know that some people have access to them, but not everyone, um, to go ahead and use those when you're concerned for um, opiate toxicity. And so just going back to say, wow, I have no idea when to use those antidote injections. Um, as we were talking about with organophosphate poisonings or nerve agent poisonings of any kind, where you're seeing these severe symptoms as noted on the left, heart's not beating fast, they're turning blue despite breathing fast. And you're again, hearing that bronchospasm sounds like those striders and um, those sounds coming from the neck, or you're just seeing a lot of salivation their, you know, the diarrhea, the ur urination and emesis, and um, that unfortunately lovely image there, that's when you're going to be wanting to use those um, duodotes or antidotes um, in the case of those kinds of toxicity or poisonings. So now that you're already saving lives, let's talk about some of those next steps about assigning triage. Great question. Um, let's go back for a second. So Angie asked, will we do harm if we give the duodotes and are wrong? So if the patients look sick enough, it is unlikely that you're going to do a lot of harm. Now, one of these, I'll go back one more page, is atropine. Um, and so a lot of you may be familiar with using atropine, that there are still potentially side effects. But again, we are thinking that those side effects totally are lower than the concern of the benefit of giving that medicine, that we'd rather give that medicine for sure. And pralidoxine, which also helps um, kind of the longer term with some of the fasciculations, the seizures and things like that as well. Um, that that actually is also a bit lower risk as, too, especially as you're giving it to a symptomatic patient. Now, if they're completely asymptomatic, probably would wait on using your auto your antidote auto injector, of course. But if they show any kinds of symptoms, it's unlikely to have severe side effects or issues with giving it. So, great question, Angie. All right, so we're talking about the next steps. So we're talking about the individual assessment after we did those initial, or trying to do this as initial sorting, where we talked about red, yellow, green, expectant, and dead. And so again, talking about expectant, especially knowing your resources. Is this a small group of people? It turns out that you can actually transport everyone to the hospital and they could potentially all get that more standard level of care that we're used to in blue skies. Maybe, but for the most part, if we're using these kinds of triage systems, it probably is a larger um, incident with more casualties or victims. And because of that, we're likely going to be using all of these assignments um, when we're trying to assess patients. And so, as I think most of you know, but I'll just reiterate for red, that generally means people who need immediate care, like within the first hour or within the next hour um, for them to survive. Delayed means about two to three hours, maybe longer, but will need some kind of definitive care, more aggressive treatment. Minimal or minor, um, 
would be very limited ones where their survivability is very high, like 90%. Expectant is the thought that although the patients are really sick with the resources at hand, that it's unlikely they'll survive. And of course, dead is dead or severely, severely unresponsive, apneic, almost dead. And why I specifically am calling out salt triage is when you're doing these individual assessments of assigning red, yellow, and green is you don't want to have to, you don't have your stethoscope on you. You don't have a blood pressure cuff. You are not going to get your watch out and count 30 respirations or chest rise or pulse and things like that. That's why if you can use just cap refill and eyeball the patient, recognize their injuries, recognize how they look or how they're talking to you or how they're not talking to you. Um, hopefully that will be enough to kind of assign these people um, to these different um, uh, levels of need or immediate need. And so what could constitute dead? Um, patients not breathing after one airway maneuver or for the pediatrics to rescue breaths. And those are people that unfortunately you will be moving on to the next patient um, after you do your uh, initial assessment. Immediate, as we kind of talked about, again, this is for salt triage, but I think a lot of you are similar for ramp and start, what your patients would look like. Um, where they may be unable to follow commands or no purposeful movements, maybe no peripheral pulse because they're in shock, um, but they're in obvious respiratory distress to Kipnik trying to get that oxygen in. Um, and then also seeing like some kind of life-threatening external hemorrhage or obvious injury. And then again, the thought is that they're likely to survive with available resources. And so having some understanding of where are these hospitals that you may have to transport to, what does the area around you, what's the kind of specialty care that they have? These are all things that you likely all know and could think about um, as you're making these very quick decisions. Expectant is very similar to immediate, but um, as we kind of talked about, is that they're unlikely to sur survive with available resources. And that's when, you know, um, they may need just extensive salvage or extensive surgeries or things like that, or even from there, the likelihood is that they will not survive even with all the blood products you can imagine, even going to surgery and things like that, where it just um, either their injuries themselves or how long they were, you know, before receiving care could just be detrimental and their survivability is poor. Some of the poor outcomes from a pre-hospital setting and also um, at arrival to the emergency department now, again, these are some recommendations by national uh, entities. Obviously, these are not all black or white and <laughs> conveniently expectant or gray. But anyway, the purpose of that joke is the fact that we expect poor outcomes when we have uh, patients with severe head injuries with a GCS less than eight, um, third degree burns that are greater than 30% body surface area, open skull fractures, Patients with multiple amputations, which could be related to a crush injury and especially in blast injuries. Those with respiratory failure where they're, again, cyanotic that may not be easily reversible. Severe torso trauma. Um, and then, of course, as we kind of talked about, if they're completely in cardiac arrest or completely unresponsive despite those airway maneuvers. And as we all know, um, because I've received these patients in the emergency department, most of you have transported sick patients that in the perfect blue sky scenario where we have all the surgeons, all the blood, all the ER teams ready that um, sometimes these can be survivable and then sometimes they're not even in the most perfect conditions. But again, in an MCI, we're talking about what resources we have, what can we do, how can we optimize the greater good for the most amount of patients. So delayed, um, are people who can hopefully follow commands or purposeful movements, um, not necessarily in shock, of course, um, where they can kind of get that delayed care and still survive. They're not in respiratory distress. They don't have obvious life-threatening external hemorrhage, and but we know that their injuries are not just minor, like scrapes and small lacks and a few broken bones. Minimal um, is also pretty straightforward where we consider them having minor injuries as well. Um, now, is there the potential that these patients can deteriorate? Absolutely. Um, could there be something going on internally? Totally. 
um, but just things to keep in mind, but that's why we need those reassessments later. And so, Fortunately, with red, yellow, and green and expectant um, designations, the treatment and transport priority can be pretty obvious. So with immediate red patients, we're going to try to move them as fast as we can because we want them to survive. And we know that we have a chance, a pretty good chance at survival if they get the care they need, especially within the first hour. And then delayed are probably going to be the next transfers and greens. Um, transfer, or maybe you can possibly talk to medical command and discharge them or, you know, have them be released from the scene. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you to follow your protocols, but in the most ideal world, if hospitals are overwhelmed, that might be a situation that um, you come across at some point in time. Um, with expectant patients, again, that treatment transport as resources allow, you want to get those reds and yellows out right away, depending on what's going on with the greens, you may be able to transfer the expectants or there might be um, some kind of uh, command decision that those patients are going to stay on scene until we know that everyone else is appropriately transported and cared for. And then, of course, deferring transport um, in the patients that are deemed dead. So triage pitfalls, as um, most of you are probably aware, over triage, where you're seeing patients and you think, oh my gosh, they're definitely a red. I got to get them moving when what if they're more of a yellow or green, other people think, and are, you know, you don't want to put the resources to the wrong people who maybe don't need it right away. And then under triage, not recognizing, especially those blunt injuries and things like that, or you say, hey, their mentation's fine. I had no idea this was going on. Um, under triage can definitely cause harm. And then in pediatrics, you know, a lot of times there's over triage there, or it's difficult to triage them in general, just because a lot of peds have great reserve until they don't, and then they crash. And families, how are you going to triage a bunch of a whole family together? Some are red, some are yellow, some are greens. Do I, you know, individually assess them? How do I move them? And then, of course, in certain areas, especially for um, some people where you may recognize people, victims, like you, oh my gosh, that's my church member. Oh, I go to the grocery store. That's my neighbor. And you may recognize some of the people that you're caring for. And that can be all difficult with triaging and trying to be as um, straightforward and using, you know, your critical thinking. But then that's sometimes when emotions come into play. So patient ID, again, a lot of people, it will come down to using what you have. If you have tape, use tape. If you have your triage tags, use them. Um, ideally, if you can write on them, you can. And that way it can help with documentation. Um, maybe a little bit of patient tracking as well can be utilized. But in um, large incidents like the Pulse nightclub shooting, they didn't even tag a lot of people. And in other incidents as well, they didn't tag. They just scooped and run, especially with the red patients. And so if you have the opportunity to use it, it again will help with communication. And the more visual and obvious will be great. Um, some of the notes on this PowerPoint slide just recognize some people may not be English speaking. You may be dealing with pediatrics or you're dealing with people that are nonverbal or unconscious where to ID these people, you might be using tattoos, birthmarks, scars, um, and things like that. But, you know, if people can offer a name, um, the street they live on or their pets, especially for kids or their age, that might be helpful as well. Again, pitfalls with tagging. Um, ID may not be necessary, especially if you know you're moving those red patients fast, you may not need to tag those. Um, as we talked about, you may tarps may not be useful and you don't have um, tarps available and the patient may deteriorate. So your tagging may be totally useless. And then what's interesting about these specific patient tags that I have shown is that greens are at the bottom of the tag. But what if I don't think I'm a green? What if I'm a patient and I think I'm more important? I'm going to take it off. I'm going to say I'm a yellow or I'm a red so that I get faster care because my ankle hurts. You never know. And so keeping in mind that there's definitely pitfalls to all of these things. And again, as much as you fill out will be as much as that you can track as uh, Jeremy uh, noted as well in the chat. Other triage considerations, as we talked about casualty collection points, which I'll talk about a little bit further, triaging can be difficult when you know you have to decontaminate or you don't want to get too close to people who may have been exposed to certain chemicals. Um, 
Also with triage, what other treatment can I do on scene um, may affect like, hey, I think I can just do X, Y, Z and this patient's going to be okay. Or I have no treatment capabilities. We're just going to, you know, transport them as fast as we can. And will patients need secondary triage, especially the yellows, potentially the greens, and maybe looking at the expectant patients as well. If situations change or their clinical status changes, um, that is going to come into play as well as transport. You know, I'm going to triage a certain way, but where am I taking my reds or where everyone's burned? Where are they going to go? Or where, where do I know there's decontamination? Cause I'm not going to be able to decontaminate on scene. And then as we talked about patient tracking, what does your EMS agency or your jurisdictions use? And is there anything you can help facilitate um, that you can communicate? Because sometimes that can be really difficult and losing patients is common, unfortunately. Um, I know there's systems out there like HC standard. I think that's the GE product and there's um, Pulsera and things like that. Um, if you know how to use them and you have access to them, great, but make sure that there's that interoperability and inner facility use as well, um, because it can be hard and it is so easy to lose patients, unfortunately, and especially with patient reunification um, and, you know, trying to help out families find out where their loved ones are. So casualty collection points, you may be in charge of setting this up with unified command and keeping in mind that you want this to be safe from hazards. So if this, there's an ongoing incident or some kind of decontamination, structural collapse, be away from that, but still close to the incident site so that you could patients can find you or see you, um, or that you don't have to waste time physically moving people back and forth and making it easily visible for the walking wounded or people that are there to kind of, you know, see what kind of care they need. Have in and out routes and, um, you know, routes of ingress and egress. And then ideally in the right kind of chemical or toxic issue, upwind and uphill. Um, I like this picture because it just shows that the warm zone of any kind of chemical contamination should be 300 yards away is the warm zone. And that's hopefully where you're decontaminating, which we'll talk about a little bit briefly. And then as well as the cold zone should be even farther away, again, upwind and uphill, at least 50 yards away. And I know that if some of you are also um, firefighters, and do tech rescues and things like that, you have your ERG, your emergency response guide that can help you figure out how to set up some of these things, including casualty collection points and the warm zone and cold zone. So let's talk briefly about hazardous materials, decontamination. Um, the good news is, is that with disrobing and disrobing as soon as possible, taking off those clothes, you're going to get at least 90% of the main toxins, debris, dirt, whatever contaminant off just by disrobing. But hopefully you have a blanket, a gown, um, you know, a warming blanket, those foil blankets, anything to kind of cover them up and try to keep them warm, but also keep them um, protected, at least like maintaining privacy as best you can, because all patients are at risk for hypothermia. And then if you have access to wet decontamination or you're, you know, working with fire or you have a hazmat team readily available, more power to you, you can set up wet decontamination on scene, but dry decontamination, again, just taking off those clothes, wiping down things will be the majority of what you need to do to transport the patient to the next facility. And this is, speaks true also with radiation. Um, I won't go into a lot of uh, a deep dive on this part, but just keeping in mind that radiation is unlikely to harm the first responder. Chemicals are more likely to harm the first responders without decontamination, but the patients or victims who get exposed outside of debris, dirty bombs, a lot of times they'll be irradiated and it'll almost be like a sunburn. The same way you can't pass along a sunburn to each other um, is the same way these patients are, will not cause harm because of the fact that they were irradiated by whatever source they were exposed to. And so knowing that, again, you can disrobe if there's some kind of debris or radi radioactive particles on them. Again, that's different. That's more of like a dirty bomb, some kind of dispersal, some kind of explosion with radiation versus actually being irradiated from a, a site or a location or um, an area itself. 
I'm not going to go into the details of radiation on this talk, but uh, just know that it's the chemicals that are the most important to protect you and protect all of your other first responders. And that wearing standard PPE for transport is likely all you need once you do some form of even dry decontamination, unless otherwise stated, noted, talking to your tech specialist, talking to your hazmat team, talking to your incident commander, you know, getting that point across. Because of course, scene safety is an important but most likely with just simple decontamination measures that you will likely be protected. So transport, as most of you know, coordination and communication is key. Talking to your dispatch, if that's your chain of communication or medical command, if that's what's set up, you know, in unified command, um, talking to other EMS agencies so you know who's transporting where, Sometimes it is transporting or calling and communicating with hospitals directly to know if they're overwhelmed, if they're accepting patients, or they might still be under a threat as well, depending on the situation. And sometimes talking to law enforcement could be important too. I bring this up because so many incidents, especially in the last decade, have shown a high volume of patients end up at hospitals either by themselves, like self-transport, private transport, Ubers, or law enforcement has been um, transporting patients immediately from the scene. Um, the Aurora shooting, Pulse nightclub, Las Vegas, um, country music festival, all of those things that occurred. And so um, as high as, you know, 70% of patients have been non-EMS transport to hospitals in certain incidents. And so keeping that in mind, which is just nuts, <laughs> in my opinion, is um, uh, thinking about that, why that discussion coordination is so important so you can figure out where to take patients to optimize their uh, care and their survivability. And so leapfrogging distribution, as some of you may have heard before, is where you may actually skip a hospital that might be overwhelmed or doesn't have the specialty care that you need and going to another facility in the area for transport. And then keeping in mind, of course, special specialty care needs, pediatric centers, burn centers, trauma centers, or maybe you need that decontamination or you need those where you know that radi where radiation could be cared for, like the RITN networks, which are specific hospitals that um, are have that radiation specialty care. And then thinking about who am I transporting and with whom, like with families, with pediatric patients, that if you're transporting a whole family unit, that the patient with the most critical injuries should go to that destination. So if it's the mom with the worst injuries and the pediatric, the child isn't so sick with injuries, go to the adult hospital or you have a super sick kid with parents looking okay, take them to the pediatric hospital and they of course can still seek care. The adults still can. Um, and again, you may have a different rule of thumb with your uh, team or your agency, but there's been recommendations out there that peds less than eight years old with traumatic injuries should go to a pediatric trauma center. And again, these are just overall recommendations. If you have the ability to follow your own protocols, please do so. So let's talk about transport management. You may have a prolonged transport time based on availability, based on location, based on overwhelmed hospitals or trying to go to those specialty care centers. What can you do um, in your truck or rig or whatever transport you're in, you might be, you know, driving a, a, bu a bus, like a mass casualty bus or something else. What can you do while you're transporting? Um, I'll give the caveat that the more hands, the better, and the more that you may be capable of, but keeping in mind that you can be reassessing the patients, of course, especially those yellows where you don't really know which direction they're going. Um, reassess them, expose them. Did you miss a penetrating injury in their groin, in their axilla or armpit, in their back that could totally sway maybe your handoff 
um, or the ultimate care for the patient. Um, can I maintain siege spine with those blast patients, with those motor vehicle, with those structural collapses, um, things like that? You know, you can keep that in place and that can help a lot the patient. Could you do further hemorrhage control, which I'll talk about a little bit more, or reassess those things you did like chest seals, needle decompressions, or tourniquet placement, reassess them. Of course, continue airway maneuvers and devices, um, bag if you can, or just offer oxygen supplementation. Um, I know with our advanced trauma life support guidelines to give oxygen to most traumatic patients to improve oxygen delivery, especially if you don't have blood or other ways to improve their oxygen delivery um, in the rest of their body. Eye irrigation, that's the picture on the bottom right. If patients were exposed to some kind of chemical, to some kind of debris, you can set up a nasal cannula with an IV bag and just rinse, rinse, rinse. Same thing with pepper spray. If you have a, any kind of gassing, you know, if there were riot control measures where people are just really bumming and they're screaming, they're complaining that their eyes hurt, you can easily set this up um, in the back so that the patients can try to get some relief and irrigate their eyes. Um, pain control, of course, you know, offer those meds, make them feel better. They have these horrible injuries and it's gonna, it could be a long transport time. Um, further things to optimize for the traumatic patient, prevent hypothermia, get those blankets on um, or anything you can to try to keep them warm. And then reassurance, talk to them if you can. Um, you know, let them know they're going to be okay because you can only imagine what they're going through because I can only imagine what you're going through transporting these patients. So specifically, while you're transporting the patient, hemorrhage control. If you have more hands and you can apply direct pressure, do it. Same way if you have, you have the um, availability of special dressings like quick clot, use them. Um, use your pelvic binder Use those tourniquets that you found. You're like, oh yeah, I found, I forgot we have them. Or splint, really bad dislocations and things like that where maybe there might be some kind of vascular injury. Try splinting and that could potentially help with perfusion, especially distally. And that can help also with uh, internal bleeding. Obviously in the ideal setting, if you're concerned for shock, the use of blood products is ideal. Do you have access to blood products? I know that that can be very limited in the pre-hospital setting and even uh, massive transfusions, like not just only PRBCs or whole blood, but if you have things like FFP um, or plasma in general, you know, use them if you got them, especially in those long transport times, showing signs of shock, use them. Otherwise, other things that you can do, IV fluids um, have definitely been a hot topic. Um, and what I'd recommend and what I've been reading and seeing, and again, you can follow your protocols, but if someone is showing signs of shock and you're concerned specifically for hemorrhagic shock, to start with just 500 cc's of crystalloid, whatever you have, normal saline or LR, and then reassess because there's always the concern that if they're in hemorrhagic shock, they need blood. That's what ultimately they need. And so giving them a lot of crystalloid may help in the short term, but in the long term could uh, cause problems later on. So doing those small, small boluses and reassessing might be the best way to utilize what you have while you're transporting. And then also the use of TXA, if you have that available. Um, those are the patients that you're going to be using. Um, if their injuries have been in less than three hours of occurrence, you can go ahead and, and try it. And again, this is for people with active hemorrhage or concerns for hemorrhagic shock. And that's when you're using one gram in a hundred cc's of IV crystalloid fluid. Burn care. You can definitely do burn care in route. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is the close monitoring of airways, um, especially if you notice facial or neck burns. And you may consider definitive airway um, because of the fact that there's concern that could there be some airway edema or especially on neck burns, you get kind of that um, uh, you kind of get that impingement on the trachea. And so if you need to put in a definitive airway and route if you have that capability and you have that equipment. Um, additionally, considering things like cyanide toxicity or carbon monoxide poisoning, especially if you're rescuing people and treating people from an enclosed space. And in that case, oxygen is going to be your best bet. But if you do have any uh, cyanide um, antidotes, go ahead and use those like B12 or thiosulfate. 
again, I don't know how many teams will actually have that. So just offering them oxygen, 100% by non-rebreather um, or by blow-by, you can offer to help metabolize some of these toxins. Preventing hypothermia and heat loss in our burn victims. As you know, with the more body surface area, the higher risk they are for hypothermia and getting sick and becoming coagulopathic and making it harder for them to heal. Um, and as well as with burns, just cover them with dry, sterile dressings. You don't need to put on wet dressings. You don't need to put on any special treatment. Just a dry, sterile dressing is all you need. And if they have a large area, surface area of burns, um, consider IV, IV fluid resuscitation or IO resuscitation, depending on what access you have, um, because the fluids will help in burns with the caveat that if there's hemorrhagic shock, the more fluids, the more detrimental it might be. And so that's why using, using uh, critical thinking and thinking through kind of what will be best for these patients, especially in special situations, you may have to do because some of these situations are really hard and not straightforward and may kind of fall off protocol. Um, and of course, in burns, pain control with those uh, second degree and third degree burns, they may be miserable. And so offering pain control and route would be very helpful. A few other things to keep in mind while transporting patients. Um, patients with traumatic brain injuries, trying to maintain that systolic blood pressure greater than 90 to um, maintain cerebral uh, perfusion will be very beneficial. And again, giving IV fluids is okay for this. But again, with hemorrhagic shock, you might weigh out the benefits of how much fluids you wanna be giving them. Other injury patterns you might see to say, hey, how can I help this person, especially with a 45 minute transport time? With something like a flail chest, really it's just respiratory support and pain control. They may need a definitive airway just because of how hard they are and how much respiratory dish, or how hard they're working to breathe or the respiratory support. Um, so that might be something to consider. And then as we talked about with nerve agent or organophosphate toxicity, um, they may need that respiratory support with the amount of secretions they're having, and you may run out of atropine. Um, and if they start seizing, that once they start seizing, Valium or other benzodiazepines may be helpful for them um, to help prevent you know, worsening. And of course, like I mentioned, that definitive airway or as much respiratory support as you can offer just because of the amount of secretions that they develop from that cholinergic toxicity. Ooh, I'm talking a lot. All right. So CPR and the mass casualty incident, you're already in transport. So when would be a good time to do it? Well, let's, there are definitely special opportunities to do it where you can't just say, oh, I'm just going to let them die in the back, uh, in the back of the rig, um, that you may consider it an electrocution that you will be providing CPR and um, defibrillation and ACLS with electrocution, hypothermia, near drowning patients, and then any patients that have non-traumatic, obvious cardiac arrest, like if they happen to be so stressed that they have a heart attack, um, or you, other things are obvious with them that had them go into um, cardiac arrest, like let's say they're COPD patients that lost their oxygen tank, um, and you're transporting them and they end up going into respiratory arrest, you know, that's something that's potentially reversible with the equipment you have with the resources you have and things like that. And I will offer one thought that there could be simple maneuvers for the traumatic cardiac arrest, like in blast injuries, blunt injuries, or penetrating trauma injuries that may be trying bilateral needle decompression to see if there was something along the lines of needle decompression or full hemothorax or tension hemothorax that can occur, that that might be a simple maneuver when patients go into arrest that you can do quickly um, with the resources and the equipment you have to see if there's any kind of ROSC at that time. And again, some of this, you may be using your own judgment, your own experience, your own expertise, or if you have this protocol in place for with mass casualty incidents, I would say continue to follow those plans. So, um, that's why I mentioned if you can get some extra hands to help out with care or to help out with reassurance, go ahead and do that. 
family members can help apply direct pressure or assist with splinting. They may be able to help with reassuring the patients. And of course, if they can translate, if you have a patient um, who speaks a different language than you, um, you can utilize those people. And sometimes extra hands can help with reassessments, rolling patients, holding C-spine. There's definitely tons of opportunities. Um, but while you're transporting, if you have the ability, do those frequent reassessments, see what's going on, if it helps with communicating with handoffs, offering medications, um, specific interventions you can do. And if you have the time or you have the ability, contacting medical control. If you have a difficult case and you have a lot of time that you're transporting, that you may be able to, they may be able to offer other insights to you so that you can help out the patient more you know, all things to think about, um, especially in these longer transport times. So I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, but just keep in mind that kids are not small adults. And when it comes to caring for pediatric population, especially under the age of 12 or um, about under about 20 kilograms, that um, anatomically they have differences that could make them you know, have more serious injuries or more serious side effects to like exposures to toxins and things like that. And a lot of times these kids have a reserve until they don't, where it looks like they're compensating well in shock and then they deteriorate quickly. And so this is a long list, but things to keep in mind, especially in the mass casualty incident, just to stress you out more when you're trying to advocate for them and transport them. Same with pregnancy considerations. Um, pregnant uh, patients uh, can show the fact that, sorry, let me go back there. Although they may not show hemodynamic instability, like the mother may have, lose up to like a liter and a half of blood and may not show it. They may not be an obvious shock, but they could be actually cutting off blood supply to the fetus or, um, uh, you know, to the baby, depending on how far along they are. And so that's something to keep in mind that it may be very um, inconspicuous when you have, you know, a lot of blood loss in these patients. Other things you can do, especially in transport, is tilting the patient, as you can see um, in this amazing graphic of tilting the patient so that they're kind of uh, more on their left side so that you can offload the vena cave, the IVC and improve venous return to help with blood flow because that uterus, especially if they're 20 weeks or larger, can really push down and cut off that blood supply. And that can help because ideally resuscitating the mom will help resuscitate fetus or baby. Um, and so more aggressive fluid resuscitation may be warranted just because they do have that larger blood supply. And then one other special consideration is that if you are in a situation where you feel needle thoracostomy or needle decompression is appropriate, that if you're going in the axilla to potentially go one to two intercostal spaces up higher or superiorly because of the fact that with that gravid uterus, it's kind of going to push up the diaphragm and alter that anatomy a little bit. So you made it this far, you've assessed your patients, you set up those casualty collection points, you transported those patients. Now you're finally handing off the patient um, to, the next, uh, to the next provider, to the facility. Um, just recognizing that handoff is necessary even with higher volumes. And try to communicate, this is, this is definitely, it can be a tough talent, especially when things are moving fast, to recognize what is the most important thing to hand off not necessarily when they last eight, but knowing that, hey, they have a penetrating wound in their groin or in their back, or hey, they lost consciousness once, or I gave them the X, Y, Z just to hand that off. And so knowing to be as efficient as possible, um, what medications you gave, although you may have tagged them, their clinical status may have changed where they were yellow, but now they're red or they're actually a green once they've calmed down and their anxiety has improved. And the same way is identifying any kind of equipment concerns, like, hey, I placed this tourniquet at this time. I didn't write it down, so I'm telling you now, so please write it down. Or, hey, we tried this and we failed, um, whether it be a tourniquet failure, splinting failure, intubation failure, something like that. Hand that off. Try to communicate that if you remember. And then every now and then, if you can remember to say, hey, they're actually deaf or they don't speak English might be good to know 
or if you decontaminated them in the field or your concern for possible exposure, as well as the fact that this patient's very frantic because they're missing their family and to say, hey, their family got transported or we never found their family on scene. Anything that you think might be beneficial, but understanding that it may be very difficult to hand off these patients if the hospitals are receiving a lot of patients at once as well. So we finally made it to the end. Um, in summary, mass casualty incidents can be very difficult to manage, even for the most experienced people. And there's varying protocols, both in jurisdictions, both with your level of training or your expertise. Um, and so that's why understanding what your protocols, protocols are, being ready to have that critical thinking, it might be crucial, um, is very important during these situations. And primary triage, no matter what triage system you use, make sure it's simple, it's scalable and rapid so that you can move on to the next patient and you can recognize this is what they need and then move on. Life-saving interventions, again, if you are able to complete them, should be performed ideally during triage, getting them done fast, if, especially if it's within your scope of practice. And then other things to consider, um, utilizing things like the leapfrogging distribution when you're transporting patients, you may need to skip the hospital, especially the closest hospital that may receive the majority of patients from walk-ins and law enforcement and things like that, or they might be also under that situation or incident like during a tornado, power outage, something like that. And use, utilizing cal, um, excuse me, uh, casualty collection points might be really helpful, especially offloading the closest hospitals and kind of helping um, get better understanding of the incident itself, knowing how many greens you truly have and where can we transport them, where can we place them, or what's their next ultimate disposition going to be. Um, Transport care, knowing that you can do a lot while you're transporting the patient, even with very limited equipment, medications, even without blood products, you can still do a lot um, and will vary based on who, who you have, how far you're going, where you're going, and where the what the specialty needs the patients are. Um, as I briefly touched on, unfortunately, there are special populations like pediatrics, elderly, pregnant, um, that will have special considerations and MCIs. And what I cannot emphasize enough is exercise and train before so that you have those relationships with your hospital, you have that relationship with your law enforcement, fire, any other specialty teams like hazmat, um, especially mutual aid going across jurisdictional lines, you know, especially if you're using two different triage systems and things like that, knowing what is out there so that when you need it during an incident, you won't be confused. You'll be able to coordinate well and communicate well. Here's uh, several of my references. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you all for walking through that. I don't know about you, but I got a little sweaty. I'll take any questions or comments. Sam, thank you so much for going that. That was awesome. Um, I want to start off with a quick question. Do you have any tips for trying to coordinate from like a regional perspective? So a lot of folks on here are, you know, kind of like a smaller agencies, but may have to coordinate with nearby agencies. Um, any tips or tricks on that? Yeah. Uh, again, ideally you have those relationships before, <laughs> before the incident so that you know who to call. Um, thinking about, is there an establishment of medical command? So beyond just the medical control of your agency, but medical command, there might be one call or dispatch so that you can have that communication. Cause you may not know what radio channel your other agencies are on to have that communication. So going back to your dispatch, your control or your command might be the most helpful. Um, and and some, again, some EMS agencies have great relationships with the hospitals themselves, where you can say to other EMS agencies, hey, I already talked to this hospital, they're slammed, let's come up with another plan, or let's, let's figure out this transport. And so designating a lead, a liaison, something like that would be so helpful so that you have more efficient communication coordination with those um, other agencies that you'll be working with. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, um, we have a poll that I think Dr. Wright was able to put on for us. Um, 
just for fun, who on the call, and you guys can read it, but who uh, was taught to never use a tourniquet? Um, because it's bad and it can cause damage. And you guys can answer as we are waiting for more questions. This is Colin. Hi, Colin. Um, been in this since 92. I got Lonnie in here. He's been in here and Dell. And I think we were all taught, here's what a tourniquet is. Leave it in your bag. Is that <laughs> not right? Initially in the 90s, early 90s. Different now, I think. Yeah, it seems like in the poll, there's about 32% of people that were taught to never use a tourniquet. <laughs> that is Lynn. 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 Yeah, I'll chime in. You know, it's fascinating how now that we teach things about pre-hospital care and for bystanders or civilians to um, yeah. until help arrives, we teach we teach how to use tourniquets to all these people. And so it seems, I'm going to just put it at that, that over time, we've shown a lot of benefit with less risk with the use of tourniquets. And unfortunately, with these penetrating injuries, with these injuries we're seeing with a lot of with external hemorrhage, um, you know, uh, we have more data and more, more information that these can be beneficial. Um, but again, I always say, do what you're comfortable with. <laughs> and so if you're going to leave your tourniquet in your bag, that's okay. But I would uh, encourage everyone to train on it because you never know the next time it might be the most beneficial tool. <laughs> Alicia has a comment that TXA is equally old school revived. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And in Colorado, Sam, just so you know, TXA requires... Um, Kind of like a waiver from the state it's not part of our protocol statewide so um, but a lot of agencies have it yeah i'm not surprised i've noticed as uh i've been giving similar lectures that every jurisdiction varies a lot thus making a point of that at the beginning of my talk just sharing the results for those who want to see any other questions before we let dr noel have her evening back. And just a reminder that for CEs, please email the email address, uh, ryan.shelton at uchealth.org. Um, there's the additional information in the chat. And if that is all, thank you very much. And just a reminder that this is an ongoing series. So the fourth Wednesday of each month from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and if anybody needs the link or needs a way to register other groups, please reach out to myself or Dr. Farkas.